There was an article in the Boston Globe that claims that our demand for instant results is seeping into every corner of our lives. The need for instant gratification is not new, but our expectation of instant has become faster. The article says the retailers are jumping into the same delivery service, same day delivery service. Smartphone apps eliminate the wait for a cab or a date or a table at a hot restaurant. Movies and TV shows begin streaming in seconds, but experts caution that instant gratification comes at a price. It's making us less patient. We've come to expect things so quickly that researchers found people can't wait more than a few seconds for a video to load. One researcher examined the viewing habits of 6.7 million internet users. How long were they willing to be patient? Two seconds. After that, they started abandoning the site that they were at. After five seconds, the abandonment rate was 25%. When you get to 10 seconds, half the people are gone. The results offer a glimpse into the future. As internet speeds increase, people will be even less willing to wait for that cute puppy video. The researcher who spent years developing the study <clears throat> worries that someday people will be too impatient to conduct studies on patients. Now this article, it made me think about something that I noticed in my years in the computer industry. You know, it's amazing how quickly we adjust to things being done quickly. You know, it really wasn't that long ago that we were amazed by computers that had uh, processor speeds of, of 60 megahertz. That was, they, those were blazing. They were amazing. We could do things much faster than we could before. In 99, they reached 600 megahertz, 10 times faster. And again, it was amazing. But within a couple of weeks of using the faster computers, we were already complaining about how slow they were. Just two years later, 2001, processor speeds doubled again to 1.3 gigahertz. And we were again amazed at the speed for a couple of weeks. Today, when you get a new computer, it's likely to have four different processors running at faster than 3 gigahertz. And when you use it, it will be really fast for a couple of weeks. When the internet was introduced, 1993, communications were limited to about 1,500 words or 1,500 characters, sorry, a second. Today, we have speeds of over 300 uh, gigahertz, 300 mega, megabits per second, which is 30 million characters per second. Today, things that would have taken days to download before now take just a couple of, minutes, a couple of seconds. We can download whole movies in a couple of minutes. How amazing is that? But even that's not fast enough. Now when you download movies, they are buffered in your computer so that you don't have to wait for the whole thing to download. Because we can't wait for a couple of minutes for something to download. We have become very impatient. We want things done now. And we get irritated when someone doesn't immediately return a phone call. Or if a text message doesn't get a response in just a couple of minutes. You know, it's even gotten to the point where it takes too long to type things out. You know, we started with words, then we went to abbreviations, and now we're at emojis, right? Which basically takes us all the way back to Egypt and the hieroglyphics. Okay? Email is too slow. You know, it might take a whole day for somebody to answer you. And the news. Oh, the news. They're trying their best to get a story out even before things are finished, while it's unfolding. And, of course, when they do that, you know, they get a lot of things wrong. It's amazing how many times they have to go back and correct what they said earlier. And that's one of the problems with being impatient. We tend to get a lot of stuff wrong. Instead of looking at multiple points of view, or there's only time to look at one, and that's just kind of glancing at it as you run past it. Instead of seeing things the way they really are, at least taking others into account, we go full steam ahead before we know what's really happening. You know, we'd be better off if sometimes we would just take our time and think through things, think through the consequences of what we're thinking about before we launch off and do something that we'll regret later or 
open our big mouth and say something stupid. At other times, things just don't happen quickly enough for us. We want things when we want them. We don't want to wait. And unfortunately, not everything happens in our time. But that's okay. Because everything does happen in God's time. This morning, we're going to see what James has to say uh, about patience in an impatient world. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word and, uh, Lord, just for how it teaches us and how it changes us. And Father, as we open it up this morning, Lord, I pray that you would be in the midst of that. That, Father, it would be you who speaks. That I would get out of the way. And Father, that your message would come through loud and clear. Father, open our hearts, open our minds to hear from you this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture passage this morning is James chapter 5, uh, verses 7 through 12. If you're using one of the Black Pew Bibles, it's on page 1199. Now, if you'll remember last week, James began chapter 5 with an indictment against those who had enriched their lives at the expense of the poor. And he condemned their actions, he condemned their attitudes. They were living this indulgent life while those around them were starving and families were suffering. The rich may have believed that no one was going to call them to task for what they were doing, but James tells them in no uncertain terms that God noticed everything. God had heard the cries of the laborers who were being cheated. Now, if you were one of those poor uh, people that were suffering at the hands of those self-indulgent rich people, what James had to say would certainly make you feel better. It would be music to your ears. You had hope that you would be vindicated and your suffering was coming to an end quickly. To put it another way, you could say that you were rejoicing because the rich were getting their comeuppance. They'd caused you to suffer and now it was their turn. But in our passage this morning, James has some things to say to the poor who were suffering. He might be able to understand their desire for revenge, but he urges them to leave the desire for retribution to the Lord and to trust in God's plan and trust in his timing. So let's see what he has to say. James chapter 5, verses 7 through 12. <clears throat> Be patient then, brother. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no, no or you will be condemned. So the first thing that, that, that James tells his readers, tells us, is to patiently wait on the Lord. You know, in light of the fact that God heard the cries of the laborers who had been cheated, that he hears the cries of those who are suffering, James exhorts his readers to be patient until the Lord's coming. And that tells us two things. First thing is that the Lord is coming in His time. Now that may sound obvious to a Christian, but it's something that we need to keep in the forefront of our thoughts. We get caught up in our day-to-day -day lives and we lose sight of the fact that this life is not where we will live for eternity. As believers, we should always be looking forward to the day that that the Lord is coming again. When as Matthew recorded, we will see the Son of Man 
coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Now, we don't know when he's coming back, but we do know that he is coming back. It also tells us, though, that the Lord will provide justice. James is just finished writing about the rich and their exploitation of the poor. He wrote about God's opposition to the unjust rich. And here the implications are that when he comes, justice will be meted out. There will be justice on the day of the Lord. But until that time, patience is required. He compares the patience needed to that of a farmer. You know, the farmer, he plants the field, he, he prepares it, he plants the seed, he does what he can to make things grow to, so that it's conducive, you know, when he plows and stuff. But he knows that in the end, he can't make it grow any faster. He can't make more grain grow. He has no control over the timing of the rains. He has to wait until the Lord provides. And he has to rely on the goodness of God. You know, in his time, God will provide the justice that people desire. Until then, we have to wait patiently for him. What does that mean? What does it mean to wait patiently until the Lord's coming? It means that we have to do what God is also doing. And that is enduring human evil for a season. We're not to take justice into our own hands. We're to wait on God. Paul wrote, do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. God is the one who will judge. And he will judge perfectly. Instead of judging, believers are to continue living a life that would glorify God. James tells them to stand firm in your faith. We're not to repay evil for evil. We're to do right in the sight of everyone. And as much as it relies on us, Paul says, we are to live at peace with everyone. Paul says that in this way, we resist being overcome by evil. And we'll overcome evil with good. This is how we can live out Jesus' command to not resist an evil person. Jesus said, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. He said, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. Don't give in to the lure of the devil who prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to desire. Resist him, Peter says, and stand firm in the faith. The Greek behind James' admonition here to stand firm is literally to fix your heart. Don't allow anything to come between you and Jesus. Fix your heart on him. Trust in Him. Stand firm in your faith. Live the life that you've been called to live, regardless of the circumstance. And we can do that. We can do that because we know that the Lord's return is near. Now, we don't know when. You know, there's something going around now. There always seems to be. We don't know when He's going to come back, but we are to live each day as though it's the last one. We want to be found doing good when the Lord comes. We need to patiently wait on the Lord. He is coming to provide justice. And as such, we have to stand firm in our faith. But what do we do in the meantime? How, how do we live our daily lives? How do we wait patiently? But fortunately, James gives us a couple of things that we need to do. James says not to grumble against each other while we wait for the Lord. Okay, so we can deal with the waiting part, right? I mean, we're all used to having to stand in lines. But what is this about not grumbling and complaining? You know, I've noticed something. 
through the years, it seems that we really don't mind waiting too much as long as we get to complain about it. You ever notice that? Everyone complains about having to wait when they go to the doctor, right? Or when you go to pick up your car after it's been repaired. Or even when you're standing in line to check out at the store, right? I guess it just makes us feel better if somehow we get to complain about it. But the attitude that we express in that is definitely not Christ-like. It's a negative attitude, and it can drag us down and cause dissension among everyone else. But it's more than waiting that causes us to grumble. You know, we like to complain whenever we feel like we've been slighted at all. You know, we can be very quick to say that we've forgiven someone who's wronged against us. But we still want to complain about it. But hey, see, here's the thing. If we, if we truly forgive someone, then we won't be grumbling about them. What I see James doing here is he's calling his readers to stop they're grumbling and to practice forgiveness. If we've truly forgiven someone, then we are not going to be grumbling about them. We can move on. We won't be held captive by this spirit of condemnation. You know, true forgiveness allows us to put past hurts behind us and to repair broken relationships. Until that happens, and we have a hard time holding our tongue. We also grumble and we complain against those that we hold responsible for our plight. When things get tough, we have a tendency to turn on each other. The smallest of offenses can mushroom into a major conflict. James is warning his readers again about the necessity to control their tongues. As he tells them to stop grumbling, what he's really telling them is to is don't speak ill of others. You know, it's easy sometimes to let our tongues run wild. James has already warned us about the difficulty of controlling our tongue and about the damage that can be caused by that little muscle in our mouth. The real problem with grumbling is not just that you can cause dissension, but that in grumbling you've judged the person that you're grumbling about. And that's a pretty dangerous thing to do. When you judge someone else, you open yourself up to be judged. And not just by other people, but by the Lord. Jesus said, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. You know, we'd be much better off if we forgive those who wrong us or if we look at ourselves first. to See the sinful attitudes that inhabit us. You know, I'm sure that we'd want to be forgiven. For our past indiscretions. The bottom line here is to judge others as you desire to be judged. Because as James said, the real judge, the real judge is waiting at the door. James goes on and he tells his readers to persevere through trials as they patiently wait on the Lord. James gives two different illustrations of what it means to persevere through trials. He talks about the prophets and he talks about Job. Now, James is not oblivious to the trials that the Christians are facing. He understands that his readers are facing hardships. They've been sent out. They've been pushed out of their homes. They're living in other places. He knows that they're facing hardships, but he wants them to realize that they're not the first people to face hardships, not the first ones to face trials. He wants them to take heart from some examples from the past. And first, he commends the prophets to his readers. The prophets, they were called by God, right? 
to, the, to, to preach to the people of Israel to call them back to the Lord. They preached against the status quo wherever they went. They warned that judgment was coming. And just like it is today, that is not a very popular message. The prophets endured countless heartaches, countless rejections. And think about the prophet Isaiah. Have you ever looked at the commission that God gave to Isaiah, this great man of God? This is what God told him. He said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, that is Isaiah, said, for how long, O Lord? And he answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant. Until the houses are left deserted and the, the fields ru ruined and ravaged. Until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. Think about what God told Isaiah there. Isaiah was going to preach. But no one was going to listen. He was going to preach until all of the cities of Judah were overthrown and destroyed. He was to preach until the people were hauled off to Babylon. He was to carry the word of the Lord to his people. But they would not respond. Think about that, what that must have been like for Isaiah after a couple of years. Actually, Isaiah preached for a little over 40 years. 40 years of no one listening. 40 years of being shunned. 40 years of being rejected. And that would be so much to bear. Isaiah could endure because he knew the Lord and he trusted him. He knew, he knew that the people would not turn back to the Lord. But he did as he was commanded. He knew what his job was. He plowed the field, he planted the seed, but it was up to God to produce the crop. Remember what God had told him, but as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they're cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump. In the land, Isaiah would never see the result of his preaching. But God had promised him that the people would once again eventually rise from the remnant that remained. Think about the prophet Jeremiah. He was put in jail, he was thrown into a well. He was ignored, he was slandered, he was branded as a traitor, he was threatened, and he was kidnapped. But through all of that, he remained faithful to God and to the mission that he had been given. James reminds the people about the perseverance of, of Job. We like to say the patience of Job, but Job was anything but patient. He persevered, but he was not patient. Job, who was a righteous man, Lost pretty much everything. He lost his livestock. He lost his servants. He lost his children. He lost his home. He lost his health. Still had his wife. Yeah, but she wasn't much of a help. She wanted him to curse God and die. His friends came by to console him. And they told him that everything that happened to him was his own Everything that Job had in this world was taken from him, but he refused to curse God. Job persevered through all of the trials that came his way, and God was compassionate towards him. In spite of all the suffering that Job had faced, God restored everything that he had lost. In fact, God 
blessed Job with twice as much as he had before. And further, God was compassionate during all of this because he held Satan at bay during Job's ordeal. Through the lives of the prophets and, and, and Job, we learn three things about perseverance. The first is that perseverance grows our faith. Earlier, James wrote, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. As we face each trial, and through the work of the Holy Spirit, overcome it, our faith in the Lord grows. We learn firsthand that we can count on the Lord to help us overcome any circumstance, any difficulties that we face. And not only does perseverance grow our faith, but perseverance reveals our faith. The reason that the prophets were able to endure and to overcome the problems that they faced, the reason that Job was able to face the hardships and endure the hardships that came his way was because of their faith in God. You know, while others might have quit their ministries because they didn't seem to be going anywhere, the prophets continued on because they trusted God. And they knew that no matter the circumstances, his way was the right way. Job's wife did quit. She told Job, just get it over with. But Job persevered because he trusted God in everything. He told her, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? You know, as we face the, the trials of our lives, we show the world that our faith in Jesus Christ is real. That our faith is in Jesus Christ and not in ourselves. He's the one who helps us in our time of need. He is always with us, always watching over us. Perseverance grows our faith. It reveals our faith. It also allows God to show his compassion and mercy. I can. Hear it now. How can, we, how can we possibly say that God is, is, is merciful and God is compassionate? Look at all the suffering that Job had to face. If God was merciful, if God was compassionate, then surely he would not have allowed Job to go through all of that. You know, that's something I hear all the time. You know? How can a loving God allow evil in the world? But the problem is that we see things with limited vision. Ultimately, the suffering that Job went through brought him to an understanding of who God really is. Listen to what Job had to say. He said, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Job said, in spite of everything that had happened to him, he trusted God to redeem him. He trusted that God had control of his future, that he would vindicate his faithful servant. By persevering through the, the trials that came his way, Job allowed God to work in his life. Until Job was able to realize who he was compared to God. Through all of the things that had happened in his life, through the revelation that God had provided him while he was suffering, Job came to see that God's plans are supreme. He said, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. Job came before the Lord and he confessed the sin of his arrogance. In the beginning, Job thought that he was righteous. But in the end, he comes before the Lord in humility and repentance. My ears had heard of you, he said, but now my eyes have seen you. 
Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job's perseverance through the trials that came his way allowed God's compassion and God's mercy to bring him into a right relationship with the Lord. We're to wait patiently on the Lord. We are to practice forgiveness. We're to persevere through trials. And there's one more thing that I want us to see this morning, and that is that we need to protect our integrity. You know, during times of stress, we can feel pressured to say things that we're really not ready to follow through on. We need to be very careful about our words. People should be able to rely on what we say. Our word should be our bond. James says that we should not swear or make an oath, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. In this, James is, is he just repeating the admonition of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 against making oaths. Now, that doesn't mean that we should never take an oath. I mean, for instance, if we're called to testify in court, we can swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. That is a solemn oath. Okay? And if everyone could be counted on to tell the truth all the time, then you wouldn't need that oath. Unfortunately, the world doesn't work that way. Such an oath reminds the oath taker of the solemn obligation that, that they have to provide truthful testimony. The person who takes such an oath and breaks it faces divine wrath. What James is warning against here is the practice of making non-binding oaths. The people knew the commandment, you shall not uh, misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will hold it, not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. So to remain guiltless, what the Jews had done, they'd made a distinction between binding and non-binding oaths. Instead of using the divine name, Yahweh, which would be binding, they swore by heaven or earth or by anything else. In their opinion, that would be non-binding, and it would not in, incur the wrath of God. And James <laughs> denounced that practice. He said, cut it out. The intention of appealing to God remains the same, even though they pretended to avoid using God's name. Furthermore, we shouldn't use language that shades the truth. You know, we can be pretty good at that, too. People should be able to rely on what we say. In essence, James is saying, do not use deceptive language. Instead, be honest at all times. Everyone should know that your word is as good as gold. Anything else is going to bring you under judgment. Jesus told the Pharisees, I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. We need to be careful, though, as we speak the truth. The admonition to speak the truth doesn't give us permission to run roughshod over people. We need to speak the truth in a way that builds people up instead of tearing them down. We need to speak the truth in love. Our words should heal, not hurt. They should encourage, not discourage. So what do we get from all this? You know, the world around us, it, it sometimes seems like it is spinning out of control. It seems as though everything is going faster and faster and attention spans are getting shorter and shorter, and people's fuses are getting shorter. It seems as though patience is just being thrown to the side. But we need to slow down. We need to live patiently in an impatient world. We need to stop trying to take matters into our own hands. You know, God is still in charge. And He's the one that we need to please. And so we need to be patient as we wait for God's plan to unfold. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word and 
Lord, I, I, I just pray, Lord, that as we think about this and as we reflect on your word, that, that Father, we would become more patient. More patient with each other. More patient with the world. And more patient with ourselves, Lord. Sometimes we condemn ourselves oh so quickly. Father, none of us are perfect. But Lord, we desire to live in the same way that Jesus lived. He was never in a hurry. He was never behind. He was always right where he needed to be. And so, Father, teach us. Lord, help us to be right where you want us to be. Father, help us to to be more patient, Lord, with those around us. To be more accepting of their flaws as we would have them be accepting of our flaws. But in the same time, Lord, help us to grow. Father, point out our flaws to us so that, Lord, we can become more like God. Lord, we admit that we are impatient sometimes. Sometimes very much so. Lord, teach us. Help us. Help us to see you work in your time in our life. Help us to trust you. Because you are trustworthy. And help us to follow you in everything, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.